Hey guys, it's Steve from Fiddler Light Studio, and in this video, I'm gonna show you the top five things that you can do in any home studio to make it run more efficiently, more creative, but more importantly, trouble-free. Let's check it out. All right, so whether you're building a home studio from scratch or you're renovating a home studio or you're just making some tweaks to your existing setup, these are the top five areas that will trip up most home studios. But if you get these right, they will make such an impact on the way your home studio runs, both in creativity and in workflow and just in overall operation, just in practicality, because they solve so many problems that will rear their ugly heads later on down the road. So let's look at the top five categories of things that can really help you improve your home studio workflow. First up is our home studio tip number five, and this deals with power setup and power distribution throughout your entire studio. So one of the first categories that trips up most home studio setups before you even plug your first piece of equipment in is power. So today we're behind the gear wall at Featherlight Studio, and this gives us access to all of the gear that we have here at the studio. And you can clearly see that things get pretty convoluted in a hurry. Even in a small home studio setup, you're adding and subtracting gear all the time. Maybe you're renovating or just tweaking things a little bit. And after a pretty short period of time, you can end up with a cabling nightmare. And since this is the one area that affects your signal directly, it's something you have to deal with. So let's dive in and find a little bit more about how we can minimize as much of the power related problems, things like hum and buzz and ground loops that we possibly can before we even get started with the rest of the home studio setup. Most professional studios have dedicated electric circuits that are designed to isolate the recording gear from all the other gear in the studio, things like household appliances and light fixtures and things that might cause problems. All these individual isolated circuits terminate at the main panel box and more importantly are reduced to one path to ground. This singular ground path is terminated outside the studio. It's connected to a copper rod that's buried inside the ground, sometimes referred to as earth ground. And while your home studio setup may not have access to these kinds of circuits, you can apply a lot of the same idea and technology in your own home studio by getting what's known as a power conditioner. These come in a variety of shapes and sizes from a hundred bucks all the way up to several thousand, but they all operate under the same principle that all the electronic equipment in your studio is plugged directly into this First. And this accomplishes the most important thing about your home studio setup that all your home studio electronic gear is consolidated down to one ground path. This will save you a multitude of problems down the road and it also makes isolating future hum and buzz related problems much easier to troubleshoot. Rather the bulk of your home studio equipment is tucked neatly away in a rack or it's on a tabletop, a little cable management goes a long way here. Isolating when you can the bulk of your power related connections like DC connectors and AC cabling to one side of your rack or tabletop and then isolating all your signal path related connections where you can to the other side will save you a lot of grief down the road when you're trying to track down hum and buzz related problems. If you have to run some of your signal path over the AC connections, you'll find that running the cable connections at a 90 degree angle and crossing it as opposed to running them alongside of it in parallel produces a lot less hum and buzz. And whenever possible, avoid the DC wall warts altogether as they're a major source of hum and buzz problems. Up next is number four on our home studio tips, and that's identifying and using the correct cable applications. One of the other most common things that trips up so many home studio setups is using the right cable for the right application. So whether you're using microphone cable, to plug in a microphone into an interface, these can also be used for line level. Or whether you're using line level cable that's tip, ring, and sleeve, or balanced as it's known. Or maybe you're using a combination. You've got XLR on one side, you've got tip, ring, sleeve on the other. Or maybe you're using a speaker cable. Lots of these cables can look the same and they can be confusing as to which application they're used for. But if you get this right, I guarantee you, your studio will run so much smoother and cause you so much less headache down the road because you won't be chasing down a bunch of problems. And some of those problems can actually cause harm to your gear. So let's dive in and find out a bit more about it. One of the most common scenarios is mistaking a guitar or instrument cable with a speaker cable and vice versa when you're setting up for your home studio sessions. 
This is a really common mistake and it's easy to do after the cables are worn and the nomenclature has been worn completely off. On an instrument cable, the instrument cable has a shield that runs around the outside of the conductor and the conductor goes to the tip of the cable. On a speaker cable, there's two separate conductors and no shield. And this is a really big difference. If you use a speaker cable, as an instrument or line level cable, there won't be any shield around the outside of it to protect it from buzz and hum and you will have a lot of noise problems. If you do the opposite and use an instrument cable to conduct speaker level signals, you could potentially damage your amplifier because of all the load induced. The next most common cable you're likely to see in a home studio is a balanced cable. This can be used for line level instruments and outboard hardware and has a tip, ring, and sleeve configuration. While these look similar to guitar cables, also known as unbalanced instrument cables, most guitars can't make use of the second conductor here. While guitars and guitar cabling carry very low output signal levels, line level signals and cabling carry much hotter outputs. These are great for hooking up line level sources and instruments like keyboards and synthesizers, as well as outboard hardware to your audio interface. The next most common cable you're likely to find in a home studio setup is a microphone cable, also known as an XLR connector. While these are most commonly used for hooking up microphones into microphone preamps, these can also be used to carry line level in some outboard hardware. For example, on this external compressor that we use here at the studio, it can accept both balanced tip ring sleeve connectors and XLR connectors. And both of these connectors carry line level signal. A lot of modern day audio interfaces can accept all three of these kinds of cabling connections on what are known as combination jacks. However, sometimes that only applies to the first two inputs. So you still need to understand the difference between the right kinds of cables and the right applications to save yourself a lot of headache down the road and keep your signals clean, hum, and buzz free. Coming in at number three on our home studios tips list is understanding the concept of gain staging. Another very common area that trips up a lot of home studio setups is understanding gain stage. Now I've done a whole series of videos on gain staging and I'll leave that in the links below. But for the time being, let's find out a little bit more about actually hooking up your hardware components in your home studio setup to avoid gain staging problems. Because if you get this right, you can save yourself a ton of headache later. And it applies to your software setup as well. So the long and short of it is this, anytime you plug a piece of hardware into another piece of hardware, you're dealing with gain stage. The output of one guitar pedal affects the input of another guitar pedal. And if it's too high or low, you end up with unwanted, noisy, or distorted artifacts. So anytime we plug a piece of hardware like our microphone preamplifier into our audio interface, we want to make sure that the gain knob on the audio interface is set at unity, signified here by a small U. If your audio interface doesn't have a unity marker position, then start with the channel's volume all the way down, go back to the microphone preamp and set its output at unity, and then come back to your audio interface and raise the channel until you get the desired level. This way we don't distort or underpower the signal. In this example, we're hooking up a small drummer submixer to a larger mixer that's gonna go from there to our audio interface. So we need to be aware of gain staging. We're gonna set the drummer submixer to its unity position before it goes into the larger mixer. This will ensure that we're not overdriving the inputs of the larger mixer. Then we set the output of the larger mixer to the same unity level, ensuring that we get nice clean levels before we go to the audio interfaces inputs. Up next at number two on our home studio tips list is configuring your tracking and monitoring environment. Another thing that can dramatically affect the overall quality of your productions in a home studio is your tracking and your monitoring environment. Now, if you have an isolation booth like we have here at Featherlight Studio, that's great and it solves a lot of problems, but that has more to do with the kind of day-to-day -day workings of running a business than it does with being absolutely mandatory. There's a lot of ways to recreate the effect of an isolation booth for tracking vocals and instruments. And it might surprise you to learn that a lot of those exist already in your own home. One of the most challenging things there is to do when recording in a home studio environment is recording at home because homes are filled with highly reflective surfaces. So if you're recording in a garage or in a bedroom or a kitchen or a living room, all of those highly reflective floors and walls and ceilings are going to create an ambient noise floor that is pretty hard to get rid of and 
makes pretty terrible recordings. And hanging a few squares of sound foam on the wall doesn't really do much. In fact, it takes a whole lot more of that to actually fix the problem than you at first realize. However, if you have access to a closet in your house, any kind of closet, a shallow closet like the one we have back here, or a walk-in closet, you can make a dramatic difference in your recordings by using it. So let's take the microphone and move it back into the closet instead. If we put this all the way back here and we put it right in between the clothes, you can immediately hear that all that reverberant noise floor problem disappears. Now we have a much more focused, a much drier and a tighter vocal to deal with, which means we can get a much louder recording because we can turn this up a lot louder without the noise floor being a problem. And it means we can add more EQ and we can add more compression after the fact without having to worry about that huge reverberant ambient noise floor problem. So a closet turns out makes one of the best substitutions for an isolation booth there is. And it works really well for anything that needs maybe a microphone to be recorded with. So amplifiers, acoustic instruments, acoustic guitar, all benefit from using a closet as your isolation booth. Just as the tracking environment that you record in plays a huge part in the quality of your recordings, the monitoring environment that you listen in plays as much or even more of a part in your finished productions. And just like the tracking environment, you don't need a production level studio to make critical mix decisions, but you might have to fix a few things first before you can make accurate musical judgments about your productions. If you're working in a small and highly reflective environment, there are very few things that work as effectively and as affordably as curtains and rugs. In this example, we've taken a highly reflective garage space and we've hung a fairly dense rug over the existing window. And then on the curtain rod, we've added some rubber back curtains to extend over it as well. And this is one of the most effective ways at controlling the two most problematic things in a highly reflective space, mid-range frequencies that require more density, so the rug is great for that, and high-end reflective and reverberant frequencies, the curtains do a great job of that. And in an apartment space or a rental space, this is great because you can take them down when you don't need them, or you can open them if there's a window behind it. The most important thing here is to block off at least one of the sides of two parallel surfaces. This can significantly reduce that ringing reverb and that short delay that occurs in highly reflective rooms. If you add similar treatments to the sides and the rear wall, you end up with a very controllable mix room that you can trust to make critical decisions about your productions for very little money. And one of the final things and one of the things that can have the most impact on the sound of your finished productions is the use of reference tracks. Because there's so many different kinds of home studio setups and they all differ wildly and there's so many genres of music, whether you're working in metal or in rap or in EDM or country or R&B, it doesn't matter. But if you use commercially produced reference tracks to judge your work against, you will come a lot closer at getting the overall sound you need. And it doesn't matter what gear you're working on, it doesn't matter the environment you're working in, all those things could change and will change. But if you use good quality commercial reference tracks to judge your work against, you will come a lot closer at getting the sound you're after. One of the greatest resources for commercially mastered music is definitely online. Whether it's your own music library, Spotify, or in this case, Apple Music, these are powerful resources that allow you to judge your music against commercially mastered tracks and productions in the genre that you're working on. And that's an invaluable resource when you're trying to find out how far you need to go in any one particular area of your production to come closer to the commercial levels and the commercial style you're working in. However, there's a couple of precautions we need to make sure we take first before we do this. We need to make sure that the playback level of our project plays back through the same speakers and environment and at exactly the same level as our reference tracks are being played back as well. This is a vital step if we're gonna make any real meaningful comparisons against the tone and the commercial level of our home studio project. Now we play back our commercial reference at the same level and don't change any of the other levels. As long as
long as the levels of our DAW playback and our musical reference source remain unchanged, as well as the main volume of our audio interface, we can make meaningful decisions based on the tonality and the level of our home studio productions. If we change any of the levels or we change the playback level of our audio interface, we'll lose the comparison perspective that's required to make the decisions in the first place. That's my top five categories of things that you can do to your home studio setups and your home studio productions to make them run a lot smoother and a lot more creative. Now, obviously there's a lot more to the recording and home studio setup process than just these things, but if you get these right, if you get these major categories out of the way, your life will run a lot easier when it comes to recording and you can stay in that creative zone a lot longer. Hey, if you learned something more, if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It really does help keep the channel going and helps me make more videos like this. Stay safe, be creative, add something creative to the world. We'll catch you guys in the next video.